I'm going to do that. Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm Ellen Weber. I'm with the Village of Hanover Park, and I thank you for joining us. Uh, the Village and several of our partners in the area are hosting these BEST sessions. We do them quarterly. BEST stands for Business Education Series on Technology. And we started these series through our Economic Development Committee. On the committee, we have some really, really great partners, including the Bartlett Area Chamber of Commerce. We're using their Zoom account today. Thank you very much, Nan. Uh, the Northwest Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, which was founded in Hanover Park, is one of our members on the EDC and a partner sponsoring these events. We have the Schomburg Township Public Library District and the Poplar Creek Public Library District. And then I've already spoken, some of you have heard me, about the Women's Business Development Center. Each of them are on our EDC and they help us put together the speakers and the content for each of these events. We hold them quarterly, so every four months. Uh, if everyone would please, if you click on the bottom and you see your chat button, we'd really appreciate it if you would sign in and tell us your business name. And then if you have any questions, excuse me, that you would like Lynn to answer, uh, please go ahead and type those in. Lynn's going to give us her presentation here, and uh, she's got three parts. She'll start at the end of each of the three sessions. She'll stop it after each of the three chunks, and we'll do a little Q&A in case there's any questions. Um, I have set the settings so that you can unmute yourself. Uh, watch for the mute, unmute as, as you talk. And please, use the chat. We're here to, to network with each other and to learn from each other. With that, I'm going to turn this over to Lynn Vent Ventimiglini, Lobit of Diamond Dog Strategic Marketing Services. It's a full service marketing agency in West ND. Lynn has been very active with our EDC. Uh, she's come to many of our events, including our fall October Small Business Development Forum. You might wanna watch for that. It's a three part session uh, we do in the morning. It will be October 14th this year. And we typically have three sessions. Uh, this year we do intend to focus on the pivot uh, the sessions tend to center around marketing, financing, and growing your business. And obviously, the pandemic has created new challenges for us in each of those three areas. But again, October 14th will be that event, and there will be information on the Village website, which is www.hpil.org. With that, uh, thanks to everyone for being here, and I'm going to turn it over to Lynn. Lynn, you've got 20 participants on the call with us right now. Uh, folks are still coming in. I see 21 right now. Hi, Eileen. And uh, I'll monitor the chat for you, and we'll, we'll, we'll jump in with some questions, need be. It's all okay. yours, Lynn. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for that introduction. And um, as you know, I'm going to talk to you today about your website and how to make that good first impression. Um, there are certain website strategies that should be followed to really help with leads and sales. And remember, your website is one of your company's most important assets, so it really needs to be paid attention to. Because when you attend an event, let's say it's a networking event in person or virtual, or even you meet a customer for a first time, you've probably created that first impression already, and that's because of your website. So it's very key that you, uh, you know, keep your website up to date and follow best practices. Okay. Okay, get my slide to move. <laughs> okay, let's see here. It looks like I'm stuck. Hang on just a second here. I'll try this again here. Lynn, would you like me to take over the slides? Uh, let me try it one more time. Let's see if I can get it to go okay. We can work with the last screen you had. 
even though it's got your notes on the right. Okay, so let's see here. Go. Okay. Okay, so before we dive into these different strategies, I want to set the stage a bit for you um, to help you understand how important these strategies are for driving your sales and leads. And, you know, it's really, as I mentioned, key that your website is built, updated correctly on a regular basis. So first, I want to let you know, the first website went live on August, in August 1991. So 29 years later, we have almost 2 billion websites or 1.94 billion to be exact. Um, that includes active and inactive websites. And I think especially now, there's probably more inactive um, websites than there were maybe a few months ago because of COVID. Um, but either way, that's a, that's a large pond to swim in. Um, and 88.1% of people in North America use the internet. There are approximately 570 people in North America, so about 502 million are users. We actually have the highest penetration rate in the world, with Europe a close second at about 85%. And worldwide, there are 7 billion Google searches every day. And that means that about 88% of all searches worldwide occur on Google. There are other search engines such as Bing and Yahoo, but their searches are only in the millions every day. But the most important fact probably on this slide is that 75% of searches, when people are searching, they don't go past the first page of search. So it's very key that your website ends on that first page of search. Okay, so now I'm going to talk to you about some website discovery strategies. Um, you know, you can build a gorgeous website, but if there's no visits, it, it doesn't do your business much good. And people are not scrolling through multiple pages, as I just said, when they're searching for something. And there are many strategies that can help ensure that your website is found in that first page of search. I'm gonna talk about on-page as well as off-page discovery strategies. Okay, so first, let's talk about on-page. And we're gonna talk about SEO or search engine optimization. So search engine optimization affects the visibility of a website in a search engine's unpaid results. That means they're natural, organic, or earned results. And it is when your website ends up on the first page of Potential's customer search. And these clicks are free. These clicks are free in a sense because you're not running a Google AdWords or you've probably heard of pay-per-click or PPC campaigns to position your website on that first page of search. Um, you know, AdWords is another way to land on the first page of search, but depending upon the keywords that are, you know, important for your industry and that visitors are using, um, it can get quite costly. For example, the average cost per click for the word insurance is about $54. So you can run through your daily budget pretty quickly. And unless you have an employee to manage it, you also have another monthly fee on top of that for someone to, to manage this campaign. And you know it, it takes constant tweaking. So either you have to have an expert in your office or somebody you outsource it to. So overall, this can be very costly very quickly. But of those who do click on your ad, the average conversion rate is only 20 to 30% too. And 80% of internet users actually skip over these paid ads, which basically now appear on the, the top left um, portion of a page. They used to appear also on, on the right side, but they just have it now, I think, on the top left. So for an organic campaign, it does take a lot of time and effort too, um, especially if you're starting from ground, ground zero. It can take about six months to end on that first page of search. Um, but you'll see at the left here that Diamond Dog Marketing is the first page of search when you say marketing agencies East Dundee. Um, but this was achieved organically, but it, it is an ongoing process. We're constantly updating our website, which is a good thing you'll see overall anyways to do. Okay, now let's talk about keywords. Selecting and using keywords properly is critical for good organic search results. Remember content is king. I'm sure you've heard that before, but that, that really is true. So you want to select keywords that are used by potential clients in browser searches. Um, you, can come, you can come up with a list um, and you can type it into Google one word at a time to see if you know, those are some of the, the key search terms. 
and I showed you on the previous page that Diamond Dog Marketing came up on the first page of search by typing in marketing agency East on D. But after you type in your keyword, you can also scroll down to the bottom of the page because you'll see a box usually at the bottom that says other searches that are related to that key term. For example, um, you know, marketing agency East on D also some of the key terms that they came up with were digital marketing agency, marketing agency near me, top marketing agency. So you'll be able to see how people are searching for a particular topic. Next, on each page, select a primary keyword that best describes that content of the page, and you need to optimize the page for that keyword. Don't use multiple keywords per page because it will lose its importance and authority, and search engines will not be sure of what the page is about. And this is a problem common with home pages because the keyword is not so prevalent as like, say, if you're doing a blog on a particular topic. You should not use, though, the same primary keyword on more than one page either because SEO cannibalization will occur, which forces Google to select a page to go to and search, and it may not be the page you want to focus on. However, if your website is developed in WordPress, which is the most commonly used um, website developer tool out there, there's a content management system will let you know that if you've used that key primary keyword already, which is very helpful. Also, by using keywords properly, it will help browsers determine your ranking or placement on a search page. Remember, you want to land on that first page of search for your keywords. Next, keywords should be placed in several different locations. Be sure that your primary keywords are in your headlines and subheaders. These two places have the greatest weight with search engines, uh, much more than even the, the body or the content. Um, but it is important to include it in the, the body of your content too. Just make sure when you use the keyword, it sounds natural and it's not out of context because you're just trying to fit it in. Also, images should have alt tags or alt text, which not only describe the image for the blind or visually impaired who may be using a screen reader, but if you use your primary keywords, it is also helpful for SEO purposes. For example, if someone is using a screen reader to read a web page about making pancakes and there's a photo of say of a stack of blueberry pancakes, the image should have an alt tag that reads blueberry pancakes. These tags won't appear for people that are not visually impaired, but they will show up if the image does not load properly. And they're very easy to put in, as I said, Word, WordPress is the, the main system we use um, in the content management system. And this also helps elevate your SEO for a long time. And then finally, your primary keyword should be in your page URL. And this can help with the visibility of your website and search too. Um, for example, I wrote a blog recently about content audits. So the URL for that blog is diamonddogmarketing.com, then the, the date of the blog, the title of the blog, which includes the keywords content audit. And you don't want to keyword stuff. Um, because Google will penalize you for this. Your site can be demoted in ranking or actually removed altogether. And again, WordPress will let you know that if you're using the keyword too many times in a page. So it is, it's a very helpful tool. And here are just a few highly ranked keywords people use when searching marketing topics. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to off-page website strategies. Um, there are many forms of off-page SEO, but I'm just going to concentrate on inbound links, also referred to as backlinks. It is actually a hyperlink on another web page that points to a page on your website. So inbound links are all about getting quality websites linked back to your website, which is not always an easy task to do, um, especially if you're trying to do it for free. So the first thing is to make sure you're writing high quality content that is thought provoking, entertaining, or educational. Google and other search engines see multiple relevant inbound links to a page as a sign that your content on that page is useful. And even linking back to your content from social media sites is useful. It can be your own company's social media site or it can be another company's social media site. Both are good for SEO purposes. Next, let's talk about author guest posts for other blogs. 
Um, so if you write for other guest blogs and they link back to your website, that is another way to get a good inbound link. Um, according to Google, it is better to be a guest author on multiple different sites than writing repeatedly for the same website. And quality of the backlink is more important than the quantity of backlinks too. So quality backlinks mean they come from a website that is highly trusted by search engines. And there are tools out there to determine the scores if a website is highly trusted. Um, if your security software tells you that's not a trusted site or won't take it to it, then you don't want to get a backlink from that type of site. I know we use WebRoot and that happens to us sometimes and it won't let you even go to the site. Next, you want to get your website listed on an authoritative site such as the Hanover Park website. Um, and we did that with a, another um, website and it was the, um, as you see here on the left, uh, we wrote an article for um, thefabricator.com, which is a publication for the Fabricating and Manufacturing Association. And in the article, there was a backlink to the Diamond Dog site that was a good backlink to receive. Um, so it was good for not only SEO purposes, but also gave us increased visibility for our business too. Okay, so I'm gonna stop. That's our first section. So are there any questions on the first section? Anything from the chat box? Chat boxes. Yes. Could you go back to the previous slide? Sure. Okay. Okay. So what you're saying here is that you have to have high quality content. Okay. A lot of that is non-repetitive then, correct? Yes. I mean, it, it should be, yeah, um, your own content, what they're saying is, you know, unique content is a big thing. I mean, you can mm -hmm. use stats and other bits of information of, for uh, quality. Tree damage over by in Oak Park. Mm -hmm. Alan said that she heard Oak Park had a lot of. Oh, I think somebody broke in there, but. Down the trees. We have a lot of trees, but it wasn't bad. Um, there are power lines down the river. If somebody could go on mute. It's for talking on about the, trees. On the, on the tracks. Oh. So the trains were running on one track, shutting back and forth. <laughs> Yourself, you're on TV. So yeah, so it's high quality content that should be unique that you write. I mean, you can definitely refer back to other articles and things that maybe you have drawn, you know, some information from, but it shouldn't be just a repeat. Okay, I'm not sure how much you heard of that. Um, I know, does, it, does that answer your question? That was my fault, Lynn, apologize. Oh, no problem, oh, no problem. So basically it should be unique content. Like I said, you can, you can refer to articles and other blogs out there for information, but overall it should not be just copied information. Lynn, what I'm hearing in some of this, it's um, helping a business owner become known as a subject matter expert too if yes. you want to be blogging on other sites so people will start to look to you for answers right exactly exactly and i'll touch upon that a bit too when i talk about blogs later on but that's exactly right you want to be that thought leader out there and people look to you as to be the expert so we do have a question on whether there's a charge for getting the business website published or mentioned on an authoritative site um yeah. I, I will note liliana's asked about the hanover park website Whatever town you operate in, see if your municipality has a business directory. So if your business is located within Hanover Park, we have you in our business directory online, which puts you on one of those authoritative sites. Uh, but I'll let Lynn answer if there's any other related con you know, comments on that. Um, yeah, sometimes it can be free. Um, other times there is a charge, like for example, we did this with the fabricator.com that was actually free and you'd actually be surprised how many, you know, like associations and other organizations are looking for new fresh content and they're not going to charge you for it and you get that valuable backlink. So it's, it's, there's not always a charge for it. And doesn't this also start with making sure you've claimed your Google place? 
that you've done your Better Business Bureau listing, that you've done a Yellow Pages listing, that you've done a Yelp. All of, There's a whole host of free sites out there that are known as authoritative, correct? Yes, those are, a lot of times are the directories and you should be in the directories, which is another way to, um, you know, have your site elevated in terms of ranking and placement. And with the directories, um, I think most of them are free. I don't, I don't know in terms of any charges, um, but it is good to be out there. And the big thing with the directories though, is to make sure your information is consistent across all the directories. So make sure you have like say the same methods of payments listed or hours of operation or company description, things like that. Google's gonna look for that. They wanna make sure there's consistency and they know that, okay, this is the, the same company here, if, whether it's on Yelp or Yellow Pages or wherever. Okay. Okay. I don't see any other questions right now in the chat, so maybe we'll move on to the next topic. Okay, thank you. Oh, I'm stuck again. <laughs> I don't think it likes when I pause. <laughs> Hang on just a second here. I can share the screen. There you go. Okay, you're good. Yeah, come back up here. Okay, so now we're going to move on to website design strategies. So um, in today's fast paced world, it only takes about 50 milliseconds or 0 0.05 seconds for most visitors to form an opinion of a website and decide whether to stay and explore it or just leave altogether. So in this section, I'm gonna talk about a few components such as an updated design, straightforward navigation, and mobile responsiveness, which will help to keep visitors on your website and hopefully convert them into customers. Okay, so first let's talk about design. 94% of initial website impressions are related to design. So it's key that proper attention is allocated to this. Images are key to any website, as you know. And if you can't afford a professional photo shoot, that's okay, you can use stock images. Stock images are appropriate, and there's many good stock image uh, websites out there nowadays that you can get subscriptions to, such as iStock, Shutterstock, or we use Dreamstime. And you can you know, purchase a single image at a time, or you can get a monthly subscription fee, which you know, if you're gonna be doing a lot of updating or using images for other reasons too, maybe for collateral and things, um, I suggest a monthly, it's much more economical. Um, we have a subscription to Dreams Time, for example. Um, you will have a wide selection to choose from, but be sure when you're picking the images that they don't look staged because not always, you know, not everyone is, uh, every image looks great. Um, you really want to help convey what your brand is all about. And I also suggest not using images you purchased more than a few years ago because it's going to make your website look dated. And, you know, especially now with COVID-19, you want to make sure that you look fresh and that you're in business and you're looking for new customers. Okay, so now let's talk about font selection. The font you use actually impacts how audiences process and perceive your messaging. You need to be strategic about that font choice. And more than anything, it has to be readable. If it isn't, audience your audience is just going to struggle and probably just leave your website altogether. So decorative fonts are harder to read, especially in large blocks of text, and also is key to boost spacing between lines and font size to increase that readability even more. Um, and make sure it's in a color that is legible on images. Lots of times you see messaging across an image and you can, it's really hard to read because it's too close to the, the color of the image. So you want to make sure that it can stand out across that image. Okay, so next you want to use color to draw attention to certain areas, but you don't want to try to make everything stand out with color. Um, 
you know, two to four colors is good. Um, and white space though is good too. So don't be afraid of using white space because white space does add elegance to a website. Um, and remember those two to four colors that you use on your website should actually be used through all your marketing materials too. Cause you want to have that consistent look and feel online as well as offline because color is a key component of your company brand. Next, consistent layout and structure. Your elements on your website should be fairly consistent on every page. And these include the color, the font type, you know, and size, uh, layout, and navigation should remain in the same location, which is usually at the top of the page. And you should have a consistent footer and header. Typically a website has a home page and then you have content or inner pages and then you may even have like certain specific landing pages for a period of time if you're advertising maybe an event that people have to sign up for or you have a piece of literature that you're going to ask them to give you know their name and email address first before downloading. Um, but just remember you need to have consistency across all these pages so that visitors don't feel lost. Next, let's talk about social media icons. Um, almost every company is on one social media platform or another. Um, and remember that icon should link to your company page, not your personal LinkedIn profile, but your company page LinkedIn profile. And it shouldn't link to some other group that maybe you're a part of. It really has to be related back to, to what your company is and does. So, also to help your following it is key to have these, you know, buttons or widgets for these social networks visible on the top of every page. And if you have a blog or let's say some other type of interesting content on your site, the icon should be right next to that content too, so that people can easily share it. Cause that will also help your company to grow not only its visibility and possible new customers, but it's really good for your brand too, to, to get out there more. And finally, let's talk about video. You probably heard the video is all the rage, especially now they've been talking about 5G coming online here, which makes videos, you know, so much easier to use. Um, and it really does um, engage customers and it makes you more memorable. Um, the big thing though now with like millennials and Gen Z, you have to grab their attention right away with the video. They say that millennials only have like a 12 second span before they'll like, you know, go away from the video if it not if it doesn't interest them. And Gen Z is supposedly like eight seconds, so you really have to capture their attention right up front with video. But seventy eight percent of people watch video online every week, and fifty five percent actually watch it daily. And companies can use it throughout their website. It can be in your top slider of your home page, or it can be on any inner page. Um, and just like I'd mentioned, purchasing stock images, you can also purchase stock video from these websites. Um, the other option is to produce an original video. However, nowadays it doesn't have to be super sophisticated. Um, you know, you don't have to bring in somebody professional fee. You don't have the budget for that. Um, many videos are produced in house and they're just a simple montage of photos that you have from your company and maybe have your key messaging across it set to royalty free mu music. Um, the big thing now is more the, the content than the, the look of the video. Um, another favorite video idea that we did was we created um, an FAQ video. So we did short uh, videos for every answer um, to different questions. Remember, Google loves video. It is ranked as content and it's, it's good for SEO purposes. And if visitors share your video on social media sites, it actually receives a lot more attention. In fact, it receives 48% more views than regular posts. Okay, so now let's move on to navigation. You wanna keep your navigation very simple. If it's not simple, people will just abandon your site. And there should be a simple, consistent navigation or menu bar at the top of every page. And it should have no more, we recommend, than seven options on it because that's the optimal number of items that people can keep in their short-term memory. And the options should be descriptive but not overly long. Don't try to get too clever or creative because um, you're just gonna lose visitors if they don't know what that even means. Um, as you, and as you scroll down a page, it should continue to be visible and always at the top. Older websites, lots of times that navigation bar goes away. You don't wanna have that happen. You wanna have it keep going down your page. 
Okay, and navigation should be not more than three levels deep. Um, visitors spend time on inner or lower pages as well as your top level of home page. So it's good that you pay attention to those too. Um, and search engines will take visitor of these inner pages depending upon the topic. However, too many levels will just lose visitors. Next, so you wanna link back to other pages in your website. For example, say you have a, a service listed such as bookkeeping, then you write a blog about bookkeeping. So you should link that service to that blog and that blog back to that service page. This is uh, very helpful. It really does uh, help build credibility and Google likes this too for SEO purposes. And then finally, no matter what page someone is on, your logo should be at the top of the page and it should link back to your home page. Make sure it is always easy for users to get back to their starting point. You know, again, the overall goal is to make it simple for your visitors. Okay, now we're gonna move on to mobile responsiveness. And there's a few different reasons why mobile responsiveness is so important nowadays. Way back in 2015, Google actually rolled out a change to its search engine algorithms, which now factors in a website's mobile presence as part of its overall ranking. And that date was actually called Mobile Get In. Um, and then in 2016, um, there was actually a tipping point where more people started viewing the internet on their mobile devices than on desktops. And today, actually 67% of all internet traffic worldwide is on a mobile device, and that include different smartphones as well as tablets. And according to a study done last year, almost 44% though of Fortune 500 companies still do not have mobile responsive websites, which I find kind of unbelievable, but I did a little bit of research on my own, and I did find a few out there that are not mobile responsive. Um, you know, mobile responsive is very key, and it's really a great way to reach you know, expand your customer reach because so many people are on their smartphones all the time now. Okay, so to be mobile responsive first, you need to make sure that your text is readable on different size of mobile devices. Like I said, different smartphones as well as tablets and there's, you know, there's different smartphone sizes too, depending upon how old your smartphone is. You know, your screen can be smaller or bigger. Um, and there should be no zooming required. Um, Google even provides a mobile responsive test so you can see how easily a visitor is able to view your page on a mobile device. And um, you simply enter your page URL and receive a score. Next, horizontal screen or scrolling. Um, people do not wanna scroll left to right. And like I said, some of the, the Fortune 500 sites that I went out to, people still had to scroll left to right, which means it's, it's not mobile responsive. However, scrolling up and down is fine or vertically people are used to that. Also, you wanna create uh, adequate space for tap, tap targets, which can be a, a call to action button, an ad or a link. You want to make sure there's enough space to easily enter info um, for like a contact us form. Um, I even know one company, a manufacturing company who um, enables users to request a quote on a mobile device. Um, this added convenience has actually been great for them. It's worked very well and they've actually, it's re resulted in new business for them. Also, you wanna have a consistent user experience. I think the biggest key with mobile responsiveness is to, to ensure this consistent experience. You know, it's critical for lead generation, conversion, sales, and retention. Okay, so I'm gonna open up to questions again before I move on to content strategies. I'm not seeing anything else in the chat. Uh, if folks wanna unmute themselves and talk, please go right ahead. I will ask you for clarification on one uh, comment, Lynn, on the navigation. When you talk about the top bar, did you say it should keep scrolling down with the page or is it okay yeah. to keep that locked up at the top? It should always be visible. So as you go down the page, that bar should remain with you so that people can easily go somewhere else if they want. So older websites, lots of times the navigation bar disappeared as you went down 
but it is best to keep it visible so it scrolls down with you. And is that something that the WordPress does automatically when people build their websites in WordPress? I know WordPress, WordPress yes, it does do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, I'm not sure about some of the other, you know, programs like Wix or, um, you know, other ones out there, but I know WordPress definitely, you, you can do that. And that's how we've been building all our websites for the last few years, actually, with having that scrolling nav bar. Quick question then. Sure. Um, the prior slide for Zoom, what did that mean? What do you mean by that? Oh, for zooming in? Yes. Yeah, when you have a, a mobile responsive site, it, it should be, the text should fit whatever your screen size is. So it will automatically adjust so that you can read things without really having to like zoom way in because you can't see something. So okay. it should fit your your screen size. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll move on to website content strategies. Um, you know, everyone likes to see a nicely designed website, but giving a choice between um, uh, a great looking website with little or poor content or, or poor looking website with great content, people really prefer the latter. Um, you know, they're, they're not looking online for pretty websites. They're searching for an answer to a specific question they have or looking to buy something. So, you know, if you meet their needs and there's a good chance that they'll make a purchase from you either now or in the future. And visitors may not leave your website because initial design is good, but content is what people are really looking for along with the search engines, as I've been talking about how important, you know, search engines are looking for things. And content really can turn prospects into leads and, and then leads into sales. So I'm going to talk about several website content strategies, um, including clear and concise messaging, quality content, blogging, multiple forms of content, and effective calls to action. Okay, so let's start off with clear and concise messaging. So this means that your clear and concise messaging should not only be in your headers and subheaders, but throughout your website content. And the first thing is to write in clear, short sentences and paragraphs. And your website will actually be rewarded for this. So avoid unnecessarily complex words and also paragraphs that are overly lengthy. You don't want to have run-ons. Um, Again, if you use the WordPress system and their content management system will actually provide you some guidance on this too. It'll let you know if you're doing a good job in these areas or if improvement is needed. Next, identify your value proposition. As part of this clear and concise messaging, a value proposition is key. Visitors want to know right away why they should buy from you. And a powerful value proposition will help them to determine that. And it actually can apply to your entire organization, or you can have a value proposition even for a specific product or service too. Next, include language as identifiable for your audience. So make sure you're using terms and language that your visitors will understand. So think about who your audience is and really write for them. I mean, it's okay to use industry terms, um, but if you use an acronym, I suggest spelling it out the first time in a paragraph and don't spell it out like in a header because it does, I think, look kind of clunky. Um, but if visitors do not understand your message, they're just going to leave. And at all costs, avoid cliches. They do not add any value to the content and readers actually tend to view their usage as a sign of laziness. Also, you do not want to use internally use corporate terms because your reader's not going to understand those and you want to make sure they understand your message. You don't want to confuse it with those types of terms and just lose the customer. Okay, so now let's talk about the quality of your content. As I mentioned earlier, uh, content is king, but you almost could say that really it's quality content that is king. And we talked about this a little bit earlier about unique content. You know, it's time consuming to create content, um, but copying from a well-written website is not recommended. Um, even if the copyright owner doesn't know or doesn't care you've copied their content, Google has an algorithm that will figure it out that your new content really isn't new content. It's been on somebody else's site and published already. And this algorithm 
or actually take this into account when determining where to rank your page in search results and it will probably rank it lower. But on the other hand, Google rewards unique content. So ultimately as well, worth the time and effort. And I, I know some content can take a lot of time. Uh, you know, blogs take time, but if you get into some of the longer pieces of content, say if you do a case study or white paper, I mean, you have to involve several different parties from a copywriter to maybe a product manager or engineer, or graphic designer, but that's content that really does help your, your website a lot. And it, it, it helps you overall. I mean, customers look at you as a, a thought leader. Next, you wanna keep your content fresh. So if you have news or blogs that are still posted on your website from years ago, you know, visitors may not think you're a viable business or they may think you're winding down or not you know, out for new business. And I mean, especially now with COVID-19, it's really key that you have some new content because people may think that you're not in business anymore and you just haven't taken down your website. So if you do have older blogs, set up an archive and place them in there. Um, and Google likes that new content too, and it will reward you for it, as we mentioned. Um, and if you keep your content fresh, it gives a reason for visitors to come back to your website. And hopefully you'll be able then to turn that, you know, prospect into a customer. People are not going to keep visiting your website if they're seeing the same old things all the time. Also, you need to write for humans. Um, as we mentioned earlier, it's important to use keywords in your content. However, write for humans. Don't try to fit a word in because it's your keyword and it doesn't sound natural. And that's called like keyword stuffing. You don't want to do that. Like I said, you'll be penalized for that. Also, know your audience. Not only does the design of your website need to resonate with your audience, but so does your content. So you need to provide educational content or, or answers to what prospects questions are. You should know what your you should know what your audience wants to read about, um, and you want to provide content that your competitor doesn't. Um, you know, you, you should be looking at your competitors' websites on a regular basis to see what kind of content they've got out there. You want to sound different and interesting. Um, you know, either could be a different topic that they're not writing about or maybe a different spin on a topic, um, but you want to you want to be unique. Also, you want to include evidence as needed. And as you can probably see from this presentation, I'm a big proponent of that. Um, you want to add statistics, numbers, awards, and then, and then give credit to the reputable resources that you do use. And it really does make a point stronger, um, but it also makes your company look more credible um, and you really look like a business that know what's going on in the marketplace. Okay, now let's talk about blogging. I'm sure a lot of you probably have blogs on your website now. Um, and, you know, blogging really is today's modern version of almost like writing in a journal. It's very popular and it's one of the best ways to increase business if it is done properly. Um, people look at blogs as trusted sources of information, especially, especially millennials and generation, um, I think it's X, really look to blogs for key information. And in fact, 81% of US online consumers trust information and advice they receive from blogs. It is one of the most valuable types of content for moving prospects through your sales funnel. And it can be a written piece or it can be a video piece, which is vlogging with a V. There, there's both types you can do. First off, by creating original, engaging content, your company can become a thought leader in your industry. And we talked about thought leadership a little bit ago. Um, and when your company becomes a thought leader or SME, um, other opportunities open up, such as being asked to speak at a conference or maybe be on a webinar. Um, and it really can expand your network and your credibility and gives you great visibility too. also can improve your SEO. Um, blogs are a great source of fresh content, which is good for SEO purposes, especially if it's content not from another company's website, as we talked about, it's not duplicating somebody's content, but unique content. And you can really, you know, then target a keyword in a blog. Next, blogs provide an excellent opportunity to use interlinks. So if you write a blog about a topic that relates to one of your services or products, you can link back to another page as we talked about before on your website and Google will reward you for these interlinks. 
And a well-written blog can generate a lot of traffic. Um, according to HubSpot, about 60% of companies that blog acquire more customers. It will help your company be found in searches for keywords because you're targeting a keyword in a blog, as we'd mentioned, as I mentioned. Um, also, you have the social media sharing buttons next to a blog. It will be easily shared, resulting in more traffic. And also, I'm a big believer of repurposing blogs. You can really get a lot out of creating one blog. You can not only link them from your social media pages, but they, you know, they make, they make great posts for social media. Um, and they also can be repurposed into email blasts. Um, and lots of times you can take that blog and approach um, an online publication and say, hey, would you be interested in publishing this as an article? Um, so you can really get a, a lot of traffic out of creating one blog. Also, there's source of in, or valuable inbound links, um, not only from your social ma media pages, but from other companies that may find your information valuable. And like, as I mentioned before, if you, you take that blog and turn to article, you could get a valuable inbound link to your website. Okay, so before we move on to the multiple forms of content, um, are there any questions? Nothing in the chat. Does anyone want to chime in? I do have one for you. Uh, everyone probably heard me gasp when you said uh, mm -hmm. that Google knows if the content has been used elsewhere. We do a lot of posting of calendar events and webinars for our own businesses so that they can find these educational forums. Does mm -hmm. Google differentiate between a calendar and just content on a, on a general landing page? You know, that's a good question. I would assume they would not penalize you for what you're doing. I think it's more of you're taking like an article and just posting it as a blog on your page or something like that, or taking paragraphs of information from somewhere. Yeah, I um, blocked copy the, the description of the webinar. Yeah, that's a good question. We'll have to look into that one. Yeah, let me, let me research that a little bit. Okay. Anybody else want to unmute themselves and ask a question? I think the blog stuff is, is uh, really helpful and, and underutilized. Is anybody out there using a blog? And if so, what's been your experience with it? And you know, you don't have to do it you know, every week. I say if you do a blog monthly or twice a month, that really helps. So don't feel like, because I know blogging can take time, so don't feel like it's a, something that you have to do every week. It gets back to becoming that subject matter expert as well. It's often how the media will even find someone and then want to interview them and get, get them some free publicity by putting them into a, a, a news article. Does the web press offer a blog plugin, a, a component, where people can just create one easily? There is a there is a, a blogging element. Yes, um, I'm not sure if it's a plugin exactly, or, or depending upon the template. Um, but yes, I'm trying to think. Most of the websites we do, they do have a blog. Okay. What about testimonials? Can those be in the form of blogs at all, or? Uh, Actually, I'm going to touch upon testimonials in the next um, section. Okay. But um, to answer your question, though. I would say you'd need more than just a, a testimonial. I think of a testimonial is more of like one or two lines somebody says, says about your company. Um, but in terms of a case study, which is kind of like a testimonial on steroids, um, that could definitely be a blog. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, move on. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about multiple forms of content. Like I said, blog is just one form of content to drive leads to your website, but there are many others to consider. Um, however, first you need to figure out the other types of content to consider. Um, and one thing you can do is conduct, conduct a content audit. I know when anyone hears the word audit, you know, everybody cringes and, oh, it's difficult, complex, and yeah, it can be, but you know what? It's a task that is very important and it should not just be a one-off task. It should be done probably every year. Um, so you'll really find it'll be worthwhile in the long run. And it shouldn't just be a laundry list of your company's content. You know, um, this may be the initial step, but you need to get into more details with it um, because you really need to do an inventory analysis. 
So depending upon the goal of your content audit, it can include different marketing materials. You can include marketing materials that are online, such as maybe uh, do an audit of your blogs or even an audit of your social media posts. Um, and you can also do offline things, more like brochures or spec sheets or case studies, white papers. Um, but it will really help you determine other pieces of content that should be on your website that maybe that you, you're just lacking in. Um, and it is a foundational element of your overall content strategy. So once you finish your content audit, now you can establish your content strategy, which includes a content calendar. Um, and that can just be maintained in a simple Excel spreadsheet or um, there are software programs out there too. They're specifically just content calendars. I mean, we just do ours in Excel spreadsheet to tell you honestly. Um, and a content calendar should really match up with important events such as if you have a product launch or if you have a trade show coming up or if you wanna you know, have a customer win or there's some change in the industry. Um, and it should keep track of other key information too, such as the name of the author, you know, who's the content owner for that piece. Um, maybe a working title, a brief description of the piece, uh, publication channels. Are you going to post it as a web, you know, as a blog on your website? Are you going to post it, you know, on your social media channels? Um, how are you going to publish it? Maybe it's going to be in an article in a magazine. Um, and then it should also keep track of the keywords being used. So again, you want to target different keywords. And then you can keep track of the metrics in the calendar. So after you've, you know, put that blog out there, you can say how many people liked it or shared it or, you know, different things like that. And with the content calendar, um, you will know what new fresh content is coming or is in the works, which is always good to know ahead of time. So if you need to say, build a website page for it, um, say you have a new case study and you wanna do new landing page for it um, so that you can get everything in order to publish that new piece. Also, you need to think beyond just plain written words. Um, so content for your website can include more than blogs, brochures, and spec sheets. Um, you can create content that's visually appealing, such as an infographic. Um, infographics are three times more likely to be shared on social media platforms, and actually 30 times more likely to be read than plain text articles that either have a picture or no picture. So it really does enhance your brand visibility and attract new prospects. However, as I mentioned before, certain pieces of content, you know, take more resources. Um, an infographic is a, it can be a labor intensive piece of content and, and, and take a few weeks to create at least, because um, you know, you're gonna have to have a graphic designer, somebody doing the research for the content, putting the content together. Um, but it's a very valuable piece as, as you just heard. Um, also, we mentioned video. Video is a key component of your website strategy to drive leads and sales. 64% of customers actually are more likely to buy a product online after they see a, a video that explains how to use the product. So think about that in terms of the videos that, you know, maybe creating some for your site. And like I said, they don't have to be super polished. They can be done in-house. Um, it's really the content that's more important about them. Okay, so this kind of comes back to the testimonials. So, you know, customers like to read about current customers. So case studies or, case, or customer success stories, um, you know, is key website content to consider. And it, as I mentioned, it's like a testimony on steroids. And these can be in a written format or these can be a video also. Um, you know, they can be more difficult to line up with friendly customers. You have to make sure that the person's willing to talk on your behalf. Um, but in the end, it's really worth it. And actually, this is a very popular um, piece of literature with the company sales team. Sales teams love case studies. And if you don't want to create a, a full-blown one, then you can do the testimonials um, for, you know, that helps turn prospects into clients. But with the testimonials, I suggest that you use real names and titles to add that uh, level of authenticity. And you can put these on your website. You know, it shouldn't just be, you know, Joe from company X or whatever. I, I think that level of authenticity of, of who actually said it is key. Okay. Now we're going to talk about effective calls to action. So now you have all this great variety of content and now you have to have effective calls to action to help convert prospects into customers. If you want to receive a person's contact information, you must provide something they perceive as valuable in return. 
So as I mentioned, case studies, white papers, maybe infographics are useful content for lead gen purposes and people really perceive value in receiving that content. So they will give you their name, email address, phone number, whatever you ask for on a, a landing page or, or contact form. However, you need to make sure these calls to actions are kept in clear sight in order to be very effective. So if you have a scrolling one page type of website, as it moves down, just like your nav bar, it should go down the page with the person so it's always in plain sight. And the call to action should be bigger and bolder, but they shouldn't be overly text heavy. It needs to grab their attention, not sentences they have to read to determine what that call to action is or what, it, what it's about. So you may even want to accompany the call to action with a special button or image which drives specific landing page. You don't want to drive them to your usual contact us form. You should have a specific page. Okay, so that's my presentation for today. Um, I don't know if there, there are any other questions on this last section or any questions in general. I have a question, if I can ask it. Um, you mentioned that like with the calls for action and a few other things, keep it in clear sight. It should go down the page when you're scrolling. What, what would that be called? Like if I'm trying to figure out how to do that on my website. Um, I don't know if there's a specific name for that, but like say if it's on the left or, or right side of your page, um, it's like I said, it just wanted you just to make sure it scrolls down with it. And most, I know WordPress does that. We, we have that with some clients too, where it keeps scrolling down, like sign up for a newsletter or something. It floats. Yeah, I don't know if there's a specific name for it. I'll, I'll find out if there is though. So, hi everybody, this is Anita. Um, I can tell you that on many uh, website building platforms, they're called light boxes. Has anyone ever heard of this? Uh, those are the things that as you, you can time it. So as people are on your website on any page, um, the rest of the page kind of fades away and then there's a little box that is a call to action, whether it's to sign up or get 10% off or do whatever um, you need. And we've all seen these, we used to call them pop-ups and now they just are called true. light boxes and you can um, exit out of them if you're not interested or you can add video imagery and then the short and sweet message um, in order to incite someone to to provide an action that you're looking for. So those are called light boxes. Are we talking about two different things though, about the menu yeah. down versus the call to action? And that's good to know though, Anita, thank you. Yeah, because I know even at the light boxes, last time you, they kind of pop up first and then you can just exit out of them. If you're not interested, then it goes this. But the call to action buttons or, or floating objects, whatever you call them, um, go down the page with you. So they don't block the page, but they're along with you. Uh, there's two different things that can slide down the page with you then, the menu and the call to action box. Correct. Yes. I think mm -hmm. the, some of the light boxes or in other platforms, they may have a different title for them. They give you the option of either popping up and being exited or following you down the page. I think that's why they okay. offer that versatility. Yeah, because I definitely see the ones that pop up in the on a page and then you can like you say either take an action or just exit out of it. Lynn, do you recommend any of these softwares that will help you schedule your social media once and then it goes, it'll push it out to LinkedIn and Facebook and, and all the different places? Do you use those in your for your customers? We do recommend those. I mean, if it's a great way to do that. I mean, I know HubSpot does it, Hootsuite, you can um, put it all, and I think even, um, we use Zoho for our CRM and they also have a component now where you can schedule your posts. So it's really kind of nice. You can sit down, let's say on a Sunday evening and you know, watching TV and you can you know, schedule for the week all your different posts across the, the different platforms. Yes, those are nice to use. And certain ones to a certain extent can be free. And then there's other, there's, you know, monthly costs, depending upon how many users and different, you know, details. I think the video thing that you referenced to me was really informational, that 64% are more likely to buy a product after seeing that product being used. Because I know that's one of the main, that's probably the only reason I use video 
personally on the website. Like if we're doing a do-it-yourself project, I'll look up how to install something or repair it. Or uh, mm -hmm. for, are you seeing businesses uh, tape testimonials or like for Anita Komorski of ANA Music here in Hanover Park, if she were to uh, do a video of one of her classes, is that something that would work as well? I see people taping case studies in particular. Um, we've done that with quite a few clients. We've gone out to different sites and, um, you know, they'll talk about, you know, how the company helped them, you know, what the product was they use, how they helped them, um, and then the end results. Um, we've done those quite a lot with customers. Um, and they can be, you know, anywhere from a few minutes to, you know, a lot longer than that. But um, but those have been very popular too, is, is the case studies. Well, that's a whole genre of marketing. You, you see it, you hear it on WBBM all the time. Someone helped me build this website or, um, mm -hmm. okay. We're being asked on the chat if you have a good video design program that's easy to use. You know what? I have not, um, let me get back to that. I don't know offhand. I can't remember the ones that we have used in the past. We haven't done um, like an internal video for us ourselves, like a, a program, uh, but there are ones out there. Let me double check on that. So we've got a couple outstanding questions. I have the emails of everyone that registered in advance. If you wanna make sure you get these follow-up questions, put your email into the chat for me and I'll go ahead and, and send Lynn's comments to you. Any other question, folks? Um, Anita Forte Scott's uh, suggesting too that photos on everyone's computer offer an easy beginner's development of videos. Do you want to expound on that, Anita? Um, sure. So in everyone's um, start menu, generally, if you're using uh -huh. either um, Mac or or Office or a Word, uh, I'm sorry, Microsoft-based um, computer software. Uh, you can scroll down in your start menu and find photos. And when you click on that, there's something at the top generally that says um, video projects. And you can click on that and start a new video project. And that you could do with um, uploading images, kind of like you had mentioned um, about adding your own words like text, video, mm -hmm. uh, and then images, and then um, music. They offer free um, uh, non-feed uh, music that you could put to it and then you control the speed of your entire video along with some animations and fading and different texts that they offer to make descriptions of what there's of people are seeing and you can even include image still images and little video clips and create it all as one mp4 and then yeah. that mp4 can you can post or add to um, any social media account any blog post any website um, and you can create them very easy and quickly. It's a very great tool for beginners. Uh, and again, it's free. It's on your computers already, usually. So for folks, Anita is the uh, trustee, and she's a trustee and president with the Schomburg Township District Library, one of our sponsors. So you're an authoritative source. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thanks. I'm also uh, a marketing manager for a construction company in my oh. day job. So um, I use a lot of the things and I really appreciate this um, this uh, webinar because it it solidifies what I already know and then I also got to learn many things that I've forgotten or uh, want to implement. Well, you know, another thing is too, I mean, you can create short videos of, you know, somebody speaking and stuff just using your smartphone. I mean, those are nice and you can post those too lots of times. So, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be, like I said, super fancy. And like, you know, she was just saying about, you know, there's a tool right there you can use, just put some pictures together and some music and messaging and you have a nice little video that you can put out in several places. And as I said, video is really, you know, it's shared a lot more than other types of posts. Sounds like a topic for a future best. All right, yeah. going, going twice. Do we have any other comments folks want to make? Thank you so much. It was very informative. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank everyone. You. If you want to watch the Hanover Park uh, Village website, we post all of our best sessions. Uh, this was August. The next one will be in November.
Again, I invite you all to our October Small Business Forum on October 14th. If you have any questions, uh, go ahead. You can reach out to me. My name is Ellen Weber, and it's eweber at hpil.org. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And a, a big round of applause to Lynn from Diamond Dog Marketing. Thank you, Lynn. We appreciate your expertise and your willingness to share with us. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Have a good day.